Okay, you've got a great hour ahead, 50 minutes ahead. Our next speaker is an international table tennis champion and Olympian. He's a columnist for The Times, has written two acclaimed books, Bounce and Black Box Thinking. He's also a trustee of Greenhouse Sports, a charity that empowers young people from disadvantaged backgrounds through sport. Today, he's going to be talking with reference to the NHS about how success really happens and how we can't grow unless we're prepared to learn from our mistakes. Please welcome Matthew Said. Thanks for that introduction. Thanks for the warm welcome. It's great to be with you this afternoon and a real honor to address such a uh, distinguished audience. I'd like, if I may, to talk about high performance and in particular the psychology that underpins high performance. And in order to do that, I want to just familiarize you with probably the most important branch of modern organizational psychology, which has found that you can give a questionnaire to virtually any group of people. And this has been given to clinicians, uh, to undergraduates, to Premier League footballers, to NASA systems engineers, and various other groups to probe the way they think about success. Broadly speaking, uh, this questionnaire is asking, how does high performance happen? And you kind of get two different answers to this question. Over here, people say, well, to be really good at my job or a dimension of skill within the job, you've got to have the gift. You've got to be very talented. You've got to be clinically brilliant. And if you want to have an institution that really forges ahead, you need to hire people with that genius, that talent, that set of predispositions. This, for what it's worth, is something of a dominant view in Western culture. Over here, people give a slightly different answer, where they say, well, talent isn't irrelevant, but it isn't enough. In a complex world, the dominant feature of high performance is high quality practice. That however good we are, we can nevertheless get better. That turns out to be psychologically extremely important because it provides the capacity to learn from mistakes. So it's worth emphasizing this sounds incredibly binary. Over here, they're not saying those ingredients are irrelevant, but they think that talent is dominant, vice versa over there. The reason we know that is that in certain versions of this questionnaire, people are asked to rate the relative importance of these two things on a scale, if that makes sense. But this is a really important finding, that in all of the cohorts that have been measured, depending on how they answer this questionnaire, essentially this one question, you can see where they sit on this spectrum and then go and measure the way they behave. And the behavior turns out to be radically different. And I want to suggest over the course of the rest of this presentation that this dichotomy doesn't just explain individual differences in success in the world today, and it doesn't just explain institutional differences. My slightly bolder claim is that it explains some of the most perplexing features of human history. The reason I'm mentioning all that is I want to foreshadow that this is really quite an important distinction for those with a science background, which is probably most of you, it's all corroborated by randomized, double-blind, controlled experimentation, which is a bit of a mouthful. But it's as rigorous as the social sciences get. I should have said at the beginning, I'd love to take your questions at the end. I think I've got 15 minutes in total. So I'll talk for about 35 to 40. And then if you want to challenge or critique my argument, I'd love to hear your, your views as well. Fair enough? OK, can I talk through the behaviors? I think they are illustrated, this mindset over here, which is sometimes called the growth mindset. One example that illustrates it is aviation. And I know from having talked to clinicians and people in healthcare before that you get very bored of this aviation comparison. So let me say I'm not talking about aviation being the same as healthcare, institutionally the same. I'm just talking about the underlying psychology which is basically that aviation, when it comes to a key objective, namely system safety, has recognized that however brilliant the pilots, the air traffic controllers, the independent investigation branch, that is radically insufficient to continually improve safety over time. The complexity is just too deep. 
and that orients the institutional mind to the learning opportunities. How can we find out what we currently don't know? And when you're confronting complexity, there's a lot that you don't know. So when two pilots almost hit each other in midair, what's sometimes called a near-miss event, as we know, they voluntarily submit a report. The totality of these reports are statistically analyzed to figure out what are the latent systemic weaknesses that are leading to these near accidents, what can we rationally do differently to avert an accident before it's even happened? And what if, God forbid, there is a crash, the most serious form of system failure? Well, again, as we all know, there are two almost indestructible black boxes. One records the electronic information. The other records the ambient sound in the cockpit, how the pilot and co-pilot were interacting in the build-up to the crash. So the investigation branch can go deconstruct what went wrong and therefore recommend reforms to ensure that the same mistake never happens again. In other words, this is an organization underpinned by a growth mindset and is constantly learning in real time from the data and the experiences that always exist out there that show where our current conception of the world is incomplete or in some way flawed. And it's had incredible effects on the hard data. At the beginning of the last century, aviation was the riskiest form of transportation. In 1912, uh, more than half of US Army pilots died in crashes in peacetime. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't surprise me very much. When I look at aeroplanes, they look really risky. And I get quite nervous when I hit turbulence. You may be the same. But decades of institutionalized learning has cut the accident rate for the major airlines last year to one crash for every 8.3 million takeoffs. That is a staggering safety record when you consider the complexity, the globally dispersed nature of aviation, and the fact that it is a tightly coupled industry. And I want to suggest that they're talented, but when you're in the right mindset and you're willing to learn, the consequences can be revolutionary. One quick example, by the way, B-17 bombers. This is a seminal example. In the 1940s, were crashing inexplicably. They commissioned a Yale psychologist to do an investigation, and he found that the switch linked to the landing gear, that's to say the wheels, and the switch link to the landing flaps were identical in side by side on the dashboard. So under the pressure of a difficult landing, you know, snow, sleet, rain, and all the rest of it, they were pulling the wrong switch. The planes were belly flopping onto the runway with catastrophic results. So he made the recommendation of adding a small wheel shape to one of the switches, like a little rubber tab, and a small flap shape to the other. So they now have an intuitive meaning, easily identified under pressure. A marginal change, by the way, but it had a dramatic effect on the accident rate. In fact, those kinds of accidents disappeared overnight. And that's just one example of the real-time continuous learning that is happening every minute of every hour of every day in aviation. With rapid adoption, when there is learning, it is integrated throughout the industry in minutes. That's very important, too, because if you learn something, you want to make sure everyone else finds out about it who can benefit from that learning. We'll talk about that a bit more uh, during the Q&A. Now, I want to suggest, and I'll be careful here, and I suppose it's, it's probably a good idea for me to be honest, and therefore, I want to suggest that, broadly speaking, healthcare is in the wrong place in psychological and cultural terms. There are lots of very talented senior clinicians with great educations, high IQs, letters after their name, some have knighthoods, and they're very talented. And I wonder if you agree that quite deep in the history of healthcare culture is the idea that if you're a consultant, if you're at the top of the hierarchy, you're virtually clinically infallible. You, know, you don't make mistakes. You know, there is a real level of brilliance there that sets up a psychological barrier so that when there is an adverse event, there is some suboptimal outcome, the most serious example of which is a patient dying. Instead of seeing that as a precious learning opportunity, what can we do differently to ensure that a future patient isn't harmed in the same way? I want to suggest that it is clear, both in the social anthropology, that's to say observing senior clinicians, and in the hard data, that there is a very significantly different response, which is, but I don't make mistakes. Therefore, it can't be me. 
It's just, that's a complication. Or that's just one of those things that happens. You know, healthcare's complex, people die, which they do. But that self-justification undermines the capacity of the organization to learn. Can I just read you a couple more examples that have been discovered in, in the literature? Um, we did our best, these things happen. Why disclose the error the patient was going to die anyway? It was the patient's fault. If he wasn't so obese, this error wouldn't have caused so much harm. If we're not totally and absolutely certain that the error caused the harm, we don't have to tell. Forgive me for reading this out. This is just some peer-reviewed literature. Epidemiological estimates of national rates of iatrogenic injury in the United States suggest that 44 to 66 serious injuries occur per 10,000 hospital visits. In a study involving more than 200 American hospitals, only 1% reported their rates of injury within that range. Half of the hospitals were reporting fewer than five per 10,000 hospital visits. A European study discovered that although 70% of doctors accepted they should disclose errors, only 32% admitted that they actually did. In a study of 800 patient records in three leading hospitals, researchers found more than 350 medical errors. How many were voluntarily reported by clinicians? Only four. In a direct study of health professionals in 2004, they were asked whether, quote, rationalizations that excuse medical errors are common in hospitals. An astonishing 86% anonymously said that they either agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. Now, let me just give two brief examples, if I may. Martin Bromley, who some of you will have heard of, he lost his wife, Elaine. I might not get the medical terminology entirely right, but she had a routine sinus operation. They were trying to provide anesthetic. They were struggling to access the airway through the mouth and down the throat. And of course, these diligent clinicians tried really, really hard to get it through the soft palate and into the relevant area. But sadly, they were unable to, and Elaine experienced um, fatal brain damage. When the clinicians talked to Martin afterwards, they said it's, it's one of those things. These things happen in healthcare. They were not being dishonest. Because they were so frantically trying to access the airway, they lost track of time. It had passed incredibly fast. They were unaware of that. So they assumed that Elaine Bromley had, as it were, got very quickly ill, far faster than they could have ever expected. They thought it was the patient's unusual symptoms. They were also unaware that a senior nurse had come into theatre with what would have been a life-saving solution, namely a tracheostomy kit, and had mentioned this, had spoken up, but they were so frantically involved in doing the wrong thing, although they thought it was the right thing, that they didn't hear it. It was only because Bromley insisted on an investigation that this was discovered, and it's only through that discovery that relevant reforms could have been put in place to protect future patients from precisely the same limitations of human psychology that have killed many people in many ways over the years. One other quick example, if I may. James Titcomb lost his son, Joshua. Um, and after the fatality, um, he was told by the clinicians that it was one of those things. When he went to the florist to buy flowers for his newborn's funeral, he bumped into another lady who asked him why he was buying flowers, and he talked about the tragic circumstances. And she said, well, that's incredibly coincidental, because my child died in the same ward, in the same hospital, and I was told the same thing, that it's just one of those things. Only an investigation discovered the systemic weaknesses, which, had they been discovered earlier, would have protected Joshua and other young people. I want to suggest that ego, the difficulty of admitting to mistakes, is a psychological block on learning in healthcare in Britain today. And I want to also suggest that this is bolstered by a related problem, which is high blame. If clinicians anticipate being blamed or penalized or struck off or put on trial for culpable homicide or gross negligence manslaughter, for honest mistakes created by systemic flaws, they will not volunteer the information. 
The psychology of the fixed mindset and high blame are intimately related. They're rigorously established. They create measurable dynamics, the overall effect of which is to suppress the information that is a prerequisite for any kind of learning worthy of the name. And that's why it's fundamental for me for healthcare to move over here. I want to give one other quick example, if I may. This is a, you know, hopefully a mildly amusing example of, of the fixed mindset and how the ego can sometimes get in the way. Um, economics. Economics. It's an interesting finding that high reputation economists make the worst predictions. High reputation economists as measured by how often they visit TV studios. And you, you can sort of understand the psychology. An error of prediction is a gilt-edged opportunity to learn. How can we revise or enrich our theoretical assumptions so that we can, as it were, adapt our model in the light of that useful information? But the high reputation economists, they don't make mistakes. They've got huge reputations. So instead of learning from their predictive errors, they come up with those tortuous, ex post rationalizations for why they were right all along. And because they're intelligent, these creative self-justifications have some surface plausibility, if that makes sense. In other words, in my book, Black Box Thinking, I show example after example where there is a negative correlation between IQ or seniority and performance. Because those at the top of the hierarchy are so keen to self-justify that they take the organization in the wrong direction. It is a massive problem. Um, and I would like to invite you to look at the data that corroborates it. Would it be a bit glib to come up with a spawning example of a real growth continuous improvement culture? Can I do that? There's like three people nodding, so I'm going to do it anyway. OK. Think <laughs> Th think of British cycling for a moment. The velodrome isn't too far from here. We weren't that good, by the way, in the last century. Hardly won any gold medals. No British cyclist won the Tour de France between 1904 and 2012. And people who think about success is purely about hiring the geniuses thought there's something genetically wrong with the British nation. They just don't have the, ge the genes for cycling. But a great leader came in and said, you know what, we can improve. We need a continuous improvement culture underpinned by the growth mindset. Even cycling is reasonably complex. And so he said, his name's Sir Dave Brailsford, by the way, let's break the problem of winning a bike race into all of its component parts, and then let's have that psychological attitude that we can improve every single one. Even if it's by 1%, the cumulative effect could be extraordinary. So he started with the bike design. The bike design. And what do you think the existing coaches said when he said, we could improve the bike design? They said, are you seriously telling me that we've had it wrong all these years? That we don't know what we're doing? Are you seriously telling us that we're not experts in this? Do you see the problem? Brailsford said, no. True expertise is about finding out what we don't know. And therefore, we need to test the bike in a wind tunnel. And he found that with certain tweaks, he found what he calls a marginal gain in aerodynamic efficiency. They changed the diet. They started using better algorithms to track training, uh, antibacterial hand gel to cut down on the risk of infections. They started taking the mattresses from stage to stage during the Tour de France for a marginal improvement in sleep quality. Now, that may sound a bit pedantic, but it, it, that really accumulates. Look at some of the successful hospitals. I'll, I'll draw an analogy with hospitals in a minute. Here's a slightly more complex marginal gain. Think of the dynamic relationship between how much carb you eat, cadence, that's to say speed of feet through the pedals, and what power output you get as a consequence. Tweak one of those for a given rider, what happens to the other two? No, nobody has a theoretical construct that they can use to figure out a very complex dynamic relationship. Brailsford was the first leader to test and learn and innovate. And he found a whole series of new marginal gains. And I suppose I don't need to tell a British audience that in the Olympics we did quite well in Beijing, eight gold medals, unprecedented. Eight more in London 2012, six in Rio. British riders have won the Tour de France four times in the last five years. 
Interestingly, after they won the fourth Tour de France, the third tour, the third in four, about two weeks later, I bumped into Brailsford in a t uh, radio studio. And what do you think he was doing? Do you think he was saying, you know what, we're bloody good at this? <laughs> we're really, no. He had an entire spreadsheet of all the things that he thought they could improve on. He said, we've only just started this journey. They started changing the aerodynamic efficiency of the skin suits. You might have seen the bobbles under the limbs of the British athletes at the velodrome in Rio. They found out that the paint on the bike frame weighed 100 grams, so they trialled thinner paint so that it would reduce the drag on the climbs of the 2016 Tour de France, constantly looking for where the improvements can be rather than saying, yeah, but we know this already. Every time I've ever drawn a distinction, psychologically, not institutionally, between aviation and healthcare, clinicians that I've talked to said, yeah, but healthcare's different. We do all of that already. I want to just say that in the work that I've done, healthcare isn't doing it anything like enough. And the defensiveness is higher than any other institution I've ever studied, particularly amongst senior clinicians. I, I feel I can say that because I said it to the presidents of the Royal Colleges. <laughs> Uh, so I'm not sort of, you know, I, I just want to throw that in the mix. Um, let me perhaps finish with this. Medicine is different to cycling, and it's different to aviation. But it's not that different to science. Science, you might say, encompasses medicine. It's a branch of science. So I want to invite you to think about this for a second. Between the time of the ancient Greeks and the early 17th century, Western science didn't do very much. It didn't improve very much. I mean, it did a bit, but not very much. Is that fair? You know, the medieval period, the Dark Ages. Since the early 17th century, science and technology have consistently revolutionized our lives. Why that watershed? Why that watershed? You won't be surprised that there was an academic attempt to say, well, that must have been that we got more talented in the early set. You know, scientific, there was a genetic mutation that increased the size of the brain. And that's what enabled us to come up with better and more explanatory theories. Of course, that isn't what happened. All that happened, I want to suggest to you, or the main thing that happened, is that the, psych the scientific community moved from there to there. That's it. For a long time, Scientists, a bit like some senior doctors, some, so obviously I'm simplifying, I, you know, am I generalizing a bit much here? Some senior doctors thought they had all the answers. They were so talented they'd got the answers already with their brilliance. The Earth is the center of the uh, universe, it's 6,000 years old, and a range of other assertions. And if anybody came up with some interesting data that challenged that, you know, what an opportunity to learn. These people were killed. This is obviously an example of a high blame culture. The, psycholo <laughs> the psychological dynamics, by the way, are exactly the same as what you find in institutions today. When Galileo developed a telescope that you could look through and essentially verify, simplifying a little bit, the sun is the center of the solar system and not the Earth, and he presented it to the scientific community of the day, what do you think they said? We're not looking. We're not, people will actively avoid the data that can help them to learn because they're worried that if they can learn, it shows they don't already know everything. One medical specialism that I worked with a couple of years ago asked for some conversation on how to improve performance over time. I made a suggestion, which you would have probably given exactly the same suggestion, which is measure the complications, see if there's a pattern in the complications, trial some potential solutions to bear down on the complication rate, and then keep going through that process of continuous improvement. When it was put to the doctors, more than 50% didn't want the data. This is a live psychological problem. Today, today, in the NHS, this is a live problem. Only when science moved over here 
and it said, you know what, we're bright people. We've got good theories, but you know what? They could be better. They could be better. Now that you know they can be better, what do you want to know? You want to know the stuff you don't know. You want to know how to innovate. You want to start performing experiments. The entire psychological dynamic of Western science until the early 17th century was all about avoiding that process. And they wanted to find out whether predictive models were wrong or whether there were anomalies in that. And it is that and that alone that led to the revolution from Galileo to Newton to Einstein, the quantum theory and the revolution still to come. The scientific revolution was not an intellectual revolution. It was a psychological revolution. And you can see that in the relevant documents that were written at the time from Bacon onwards, Francis Bacon, the philosopher rather than the 20th century artist. He's also quite good, by the way. Um, last point, and then I'll open it for questions. Um, you know, I... I'm going to give, can I give you a quick story about how much am I losing people when I think that cycling is relevant to, to healthcare? Uh, is that all right? Okay, so 2015 Tour de France. The key stage in the Tour de France, which is a, which is a you know, stage, day by day you go on these long cycles through France and your cumulative time is tracked and so on and so forth. The key stage is the penultimate stage of the Tour de France, because if you're winning at the end of that stage, you're the champion. You're, you get the yellow jersey. The last day is just a ceremonial ride into Paris. But the day before the penultimate stage, Team Sky had a not very good day. A guy called Geraint Thomas cracked, essentially, and Chris Froome was really struggling. And the gap to a guy called Quintana, the nearest driver, was very small. So I phoned Brailsford and said, look, I want to observe the team to see how you deal with the pressure and so on and so forth. And he said, OK, you can come out there and watch us on this key stage. And I went out, and you can imagine the Team Sky bus had been reverse engineered to maximize performance, comfortable seats, and a place you could plug in your iPad to download the latest weather information and key route info and ergonomically designed rest areas and so on and so forth. And Brailsford gave this really rousing team talk. You know, the riders are sitting there on these seats, you know, knackered, you know, they're bruised because you fall off the bikes a lot. And I realized, you know, this is quite a heroic thing, the Tour de France. So I sort of started to lose that veneer of journalistic objectivity. Brailsford gives this talk, and I start high-fiving the rider, saying, come on, we've got to get out there and beat these guys. You know? And I start drinking the isotonic drinks, and we get into the reconnaissance car, which goes ahead of the peloton, the radioing back instructions. And I realize, an hour into this five-hour race, but there are four hours to go, and I've drunk about three litres of isotonic drink. <laughs> so I, I think I'm not going to make this. So I said, Rod, who was driving, the deputy director, I said, look, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to need a bathroom break. So he pulled over on the side of the road, and he said, OK, you've got 30 seconds. Now, let me tell you, that was pressure. <laughs> that was real. But I, I did my thing, got back into the car, and there were three people in the car, and the first thing they all did, what do you think they did? They gave me the antibacterial hand gel. And they made sure I used it. They didn't want me getting to the end of the stage, shaking hands with Froome and infecting him. That may sound ridiculous, but it made me realize that when you're in the growth mindset, you're looking to learn and improve, and everyone buys into that, it becomes a collaborative attempt to get to where you need to go. And I'm going to finish with this contrast and one that you'll all be familiar with, but I think it's significant in this case, which is until recently, 30 to 60,000 people, so let's average it out of 45,000, died in the United States every year because of central line infections. Central line infections. So you all know, you know, not the tube line, you know what central lines are, you know, the catheter and all that that goes into the body after an operation to feed essential nutrients. The data was really quite disturbing in the UK too. So I'm going to ask you a question. What do you think that clinicians said about the, 
the fatality rate associated with central line infections for a very long time. It's a complication of the procedure. It's just one of those things. You know, healthcare is complex, people die. So I want to emphasize that diligent, heroic, professional people can allow, as it were, patients to die in plain sight almost indefinitely. It was only when Peter, Pro this is like one example, it was only when Peter Pronovost, the great American physician said, we might be able to learn something here. He did an investigation of exactly the kind that aviation would have done a very long time ago. And what did he find? He found that in many cases, clinicians were missing a key step, which was sterilizing the catheter site. Sociologically, it's the same as not using the antibacterial hand gel. Not because they were lazy, but because they were busy. But he trialed a very small change, which was, a five, as you know, a five-point medical checklist. What happened? It cut the, cut the fatality rate from 45,000 to pretty much zero. My challenge to you today is that you definitely want to have the right institutional mechanisms to capture and cascade learning. And these exist all the time. And the reason is the complexity is so high that the reasoning and intelligence and clinical brilliance alone can't get you there. But unless there is a change in culture and psychology, the institutional mechanisms won't work. The investigations will suppress information, as the Parliamentary Select Committee for Public Administration found as, 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 as just two years ago. When Virginia Mason created the reporting system, the first month no one reported. Why? Because they hadn't changed the culture. There is a very, in, in, in the book Black Box Thinking, available, by the way, in fact, I'm signing copies in the foyer if you want to get one at the end of this session. There are clear things that can be done by leadership to get the psychology right. That's, what, that's how science became a successful institution. It's why Google is a good... You know, Google run 12,000 tests every year to find marginal gains. One of them, they checked the color of the web links, which are blue, by the way. And they said, is that the best blue that we could have? They divided the color blue into 40 different shades. They, ran, they, ident they randomly um, apportioned users who clicked onto their website to each of these different 40 shades and then measured their key objective, the resulting profitability of the relationships. They found definitively that one shade of blue was better than the others. They changed all of the shades to that particular color. The annual uplift in revenue was $200 million. They're a good company, but they're constantly learning. They're not defensive about that. Nothing wrong with learning. It's a great thing to do. That's what expertise is about. It's what high performance is about. I'm waffling now, so I'm going to open it for questions. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you.